Welcome to the Thought Leadership Podcast, where we share insights on how you can become the go-to thought leader in your niche. I'm your host, Alejandro Sanoja, founder and personal branding consultant at Latin Impresarios, and today our guest is Claire Chandler. Claire Chandler is the president and founder of Talent Boost, where she specializes in leadership and business value creation. She taps into over 25 years of experience in people leadership, human resources, and business ownership to help the investment community identify the leaders and businesses of the future. Claire helps private equity firms acquire and future-proof the right businesses through management team due diligence, organizational design, acquisition integration, and onboarding, and performance acceleration. Well, Claire, I'm so excited for this conversation. I've been doing a ton of research, going through your materials, and I have a, a list of questions that hopefully we can get to all of this. But I want to start with a, a definition that I saw on, on your materials, which is growing on purpose. What does it mean to grow on purpose? Oh, I, I love that you started there. And thank you so much for uh, for inviting me onto your show. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Um, if you've heard of the, the thought leader, Simon Sinek, you know, he does a lot of work around the concept of starting with why. And I, I just so happened to earlier today to rewatch his TED talk on this whole concept of starting with why. And if you haven't seen it, or if your audience has not seen it, um, it will really kind of blow your mind. And it, it's, it is one of the inspirations and it's one of the, um, sort of philosophies that I, that I really draw from and I really feel aligned with. And it's, and it's this, you know, most businesses, every business knows what they do, right? Most businesses have figured out how to do what they do, but it's really the ones that are the differentiators, the ones that set them up, themselves apart, the ones that are innovative, the ones that are disruptors are truly connected to and deeply aligned with why they do what they do. And so when I translate that into what I do with my clients, it's all around purpose first. Businesses have to understand, deeply understand and embrace and believe in what they are in business to accomplish, what their overall purpose is, what is their mission. And if the leaders at the very top cannot articulate that purpose, cannot articulate in a very clear, very transparent, very authentic way, what the purpose is of their business, they cannot hope to attract the right people to help them to move closer to that, to that vision and that goal. Um, and so that's really the, the, the impetus behind my, my business approach and my consultative approach around helping companies to assemble the right teams and put them in the right roles with the right motivation so that they can work together more effectively to help grow a business on purpose. And how would you recommend someone to find that? Because what I find is that there's two extremes with the purpose component, right? I think you might go too far into the purpose and not realizing that hey, you're not a nonprofit, you're a business and, and you do have to make money and, and the transactional nature of it needs to make sense. But if you lean too much into that, um, it also doesn't work, right? Like you need the, the purpose component and, and the human connection in it. And what I find is that most of the time people want to go over that and just go straight into strategy and execution. Right? Like, what do we need to do? Um, let's create this content. Let's do this campaign. And, and often making a pause and really going into the purpose is needed. So how do you go about getting people to buy in into the process of either creating a purpose if they don't even have one or refining it as the path to achieving that growth that they want to achieve. Yeah, I I love that and I completely agree. And so many companies skip over this foundational work around getting their purpose clarified and right. And they move right ahead to strategic to, to strategic planning. Um, and I would say first that we have to look at the word purpose 
in its dual meaning, right? So when I think of purpose and when I work with clients and business owners and business leaders around purpose, it's two different things, right? The purpose is the mission, right? It's the horizon. It's that North star that you are striving toward. And it's also when you think about this, this concept of growth on purpose, the other meaning is intentionality. And so what I mean by that is you have to get crystal clear on what that purpose, what that mission, what that horizon is. And then once you've established that, you have to, as a leadership and as the team is trying to follow you, be very intentional around the strategies that you employ, the decisions that you make, the team that you build, the, the products and the services that you offer, the, the, the customers and clients that you attract and you retain and you try to build. Um, and so it is really, really important to kind of come back to the second part of your, of your point, um, companies that skip over that part, that skip over that, what I truly believe is foundational to business growth, um, of getting their purpose right. And then aligning their people around that purpose and they skip right to strategy. They very quickly get frustrated, right? Um, I see this in small business. I see this in large organizations. I see this in the investor community when they acquire a company and they bring in their, their growth strategy um, with this same sort of um, bull in a china shop mentality, uh, same as you know, a, a newly formed, newly merged or, or you know, newly growing organization that hires a CEO from the outside. Um, they have this sense of urgency around implementing and fulfilling their growth strategy. And the problem is if they don't do the groundwork of clarifying the purpose and making sure that the people around them who actually have to do the work of executing the strategy are bought in, they fully understand the strategy, the purpose, right? Um, and they embrace it and they can see a visible aligned connection between their individual role, their individual talents and passions with how that's going to move the needle for the company and for the shared mission, they're not going to get that strategy off the ground. So it is really important for leaders um, of any tenure in a company of any size, in any industry to understand first, you have to get the purpose right. You have to get the team aligned around that purpose. You have to get them to trust each other and the leadership they are trying to follow before you can even begin to hope that you're going to make progress on your strategy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I connected with something else that you you mentioned a lot, which is vulnerability. So I also, I think that's also deeply connected to that, right? Like to have an organization that works as a well oil machine, you you need that trust. And for that to happen, I believe you need that vulnerability. What I find that is difficult is that there's a fine line between being inhuman, right? Like being like a robot, this is work, we're, we're not going to share anything. How's your day going? Answer good, because I don't really want to know what's going on with your life. <laughs> and then going to the extreme of oversharing, right? When people... I think when a good measurement for me is that it's a gift when someone shares something personal with you, it feels like a gift when the relationship is there for that to happen and you feel that inviting you to grow that relationship versus when it's right away out of the gate, you're getting to know someone and they share something too personal. It feels like a burden that they're throwing uh, many things um towards you that you don't know how to deal with it. So there's definitely a right and, and wrong way to do it. So I wanted to get your take on how do you find that balance between being purely transactional and oversharing? Yeah, the, the, the short answer is neither of those extremes is effective, right? You can't have a bunch of people um, just be, being very robotic about their role and about the mission and about the business. You're not going to innovate that way. You're not going to grow that way. You are certainly not going to build the type of team cohesion that is absolutely necessary to achieving your mission. Um, but the other extreme is also detrimental, right? So you can't, there is a fine line to your point between encouraging and enabling and supporting vulnerability 
and creating and creating almost a a victim based culture, right? Um, now, I hope your audience does not misunderstand that statement because there there is a lot um, of emphasis now, rightly so, around being much more observant of and supportive of different mental health needs in an organization and in a culture. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is leadership teams that have been allowed to um, sort of swirl in this, you know, this, this, this sort of whirlpool or, or negative whirlpool of churn and of complaints about um, the past, about, you know, the leaders above them, about the lack of authenticity, about what they don't have control over. And when you're in a leadership role, whether you're in the C-suite, you're a senior leader, you're in middle management, or you're a frontline supervisor, by the very nature of your role, you do have control, at least to some degree, over how you're going to build a team, how you're going to impact the culture, um, and how you're going to mobilize and motivate, you know, the, the the people that are that are trying to follow your lead, right? And I think part of that, um, you know, it, it is incumbent upon all of the leaders at any level to create and sustain and nurture and encourage an environment where people can lean on each other. They can be vulnerable. They can express their concerns without it devolving into this, this swirl of woe is me, the sky is falling, we can't grow, we can't do anything, we can't trust the leadership. Um, after a while, there has to be some you know, voice in the room that says, enough, we have to move forward. Yeah, that's a good point. And I wanna go deeper into the people component. I know that's that's one of the pillars. And of course, all this about building trust and being vulnerable, it's gonna solidify that one. In in one of your wor worksheets, you have this great methodology of listing kind of like your strengths and weaknesses and, and running through the people in your team and understanding where are they aligning and when and when uh, maybe they're covering some of the gaps, and you talk about A players, and it came to mind that, for example, in the world of sports, yeah, sometimes the teams with the best players win, but sometimes every once in a while a team wins that yeah they have a, a star player, but the rest maybe are not as good as the opposing team, but because they have some intangibles, right? Like they have that vulnerability. You see that the teams hey, they go to lunch together all the time and they have this camaraderie and, and they have an intangible that nobody else sees, but because of that is that they can win. How would you, I know this is difficult and anybody who figures this is going to do great, but how would you advise someone to measure the intangibles in their team? Let's say you have four players in your team, A and B are clear A players, you totally understand, and they're leaders, and they're moving the needle way more than everybody else, but maybe you don't notice that they're able to do so because the, the other two players are the ones like keeping the environment um, light and fun and bringing the conversation and, and, I don't know, some other characteristics, right? So how would you go about rec and advising someone to make sure to also include some of the intangibles when they're thinking about their teams and, and their people in their teams. Oh, I love that so much. And there's so much to unpack there. So I'll try not to go down too many rabbit holes, but it's such an important question that you're teeing up. Um, first of all, there's a huge difference between um, having the best people on your team versus having the right people on your team, right? And just to, to continue your sports analogy, there are countless examples of teams that have gone out and assembled um, assembled a team of all stars, right? Uh, you see that in the Olympics, you know that when when we can we can send in professionals to play, whether it's basketball. If you remember years ago, the dream team, right? Um, you see that also in um, you know so many different. Uh, sports and I and I won't dwell on any in particular because I know the the alliances to different teams run deep I'm sure in your audience as they do in my family um but you know there 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 is a key difference between just going out and hiring you know the the rock stars and the all-stars 
and expecting that they will all play nicely together in your sandbox. Um, and this comes back again to being crystal clear on what your purpose, what your why, what your mission is, so that then you can be intentional about hiring the right people. Um, there is this myth that you cannot measure the intangible. And I think to your point, the intangible is so important. It actually drives the overwhelming majority of the value of any business far beyond the tangible assets, the products that you have. It is far more based, your business value is far more based on your intellectual property, your brand, the experience that your team creates for your customers and your clients and the experience that your employees have themselves, right? Um, but there is this myth that because we are talking about humans, we're talking about intangibles that we can't measure that. Um, a lot of my work, um, a, a, a great portion of my work, I incorporate um, a series of diagnostic tools where we can in fact measure the DNA, the stuff, the intangibles about the people on a team, whether they are leaders or they are individual contributors. We can measure things like what are their natural talents, right? What is their fast lane? Because if we can identify that, and again, it's around this, this idea of clarity, if we know what that fast lane is, then we can make sure, you know, we can sort of put in place a role or a series of activities or, or core responsibilities that fit into that fast lane. But the other key component to that is what motivates an individual? And, you know, a lot of managers are, are always like, well, it's so difficult to manage, you know, every single person. And the management philosophy is you have to manage uniquely, right? You have to meet your employees where they are. Um, you have to give them feedback in the way that it is going to be received in the most positive and actionable and forward moving way. Um, you have to recognize people in ways that they prefer to be recognized. And that is highly bespoke. And so for managers and leaders, it's like, we already have so much else to do. And now you're asking me to customize how I deal with my people. Well, we can actually measure what motivates them. So just like we can measure what their fast lane is, we can also measure what they are motivated by so that if we combine those two things and help those individual employees do the things that come more naturally to them so they're more productive, do them in ways where they are motivated so they feel more fulfilled, their engagement goes up. And we all know that when engagement goes up, so does productivity, so does profitability, so does innovation, so does competitive advantage. It's all of those things. So your question about intangibles is so key because I think too often leaders just sort of take the intangibles as a given that they have to figure out how to manage through and around versus really leaning in and saying, okay, let's measure what we have so that we know the strengths we can leverage and where the gaps are so that the next person we bring onto our team can help us complement what we're already strong at. Yeah, I guess you already answered somehow with that, the next question that, that I wanted to ask, but you have a, also, we're going deeper into intangibles, understanding where people are, what makes them great, connecting to the purpose. And you have a great line that is, talent isn't born, is it's boosted. And you cover a little bit of it, but do you have any other recommendations on when you have a team, how should you think about boosting their talent? Do you try to boost something that correlates, do you understand the correlation of the causality with business growth? Or do you trust that if you boost their natural talents and they're connected with the purpose, at some point, there's going to be a benefit with for the business. Yeah, so so it's a it, it's a combination of a couple of things. Um, so so you just uh, uh, said my tagline, right? So when I founded my company, Talent Boost, the tagline has been from the beginning: talent isn't born, it's boosted. Because I do truly believe that everyone does have talent within them, but they don't always know how to unlock it, um, especially when we work for other people who perhaps don't know how to, or are not motivated by it, or don't see the value to their business in lighting up, you know, that passion in, inside of someone else. Um, and so, you know, the first key is absolutely to understand at an individual level, um, 
what people are naturally talented at and what they're motivated by. And that alone, when you can identify what that is and help to um, better align what people individually do with what comes naturally to them in ways that motivate them, that's already starting to become very powerful. But really the magic happens when you now take that and combine that into a team that can feed off of each other. Um, and that's a little bit harder to do, right? So that first step is absolutely, let's let's understand what people are naturally good at and what they're motivated by. Let's make sure they are super aware of that because you know we also want to empower individuals to drive their own productivity and their own performance and their own development and their own advancement. So that's very important. Because you know, people want to be in in more control of their lives, their careers, their you know their business trajectory, and all of that. But then, when you bring that into a team setting, and that's really um, uh, one of the cores of the work that I do with with clients is to get leadership teams, especially, into a room together, and say, now that you are more aware of what makes you tick, what drives you, what motivates you, how you prefer to communicate, all those sorts of things, now let's unpack that as a group. And let's do that in a way where it's safe for you to acknowledge not just what comes naturally to you, but where you where you might naturally struggle. And this gets back to your earlier question about how do you how do you kind of walk that fine line between enabling and empowering vulnerability and letting things descend into this sort of victim culture, right? Because the the whole kind of crux of what I believe is when we identify what we are naturally good at. There is also a counterpart to that of things that don't come naturally to us. And the key is not to dwell in our blind spots or our weaknesses. It's to understand what they are and to minimize our interaction with those areas as much as possible so we can stay in our fast lane, right? And that's where a team comes in because then you've got this combination. If you've, if you've sort of hired the right people and put them into the right teams where you can more clearly see how people can leverage each other, collaborate more effectively and bring different perspectives to the table because there's no there's no one single employee who is going to, you know, ensure the sustainable growth of your business, but one can certainly bring it down. So it's really through leveraging the power of a team through better awareness, through trust, through managed vulnerability, right? Um, that teams can can work together in a more cohesive way because you're starting from a place of human connection versus just throwing them into a room and saying, here's the strategy, go execute it. And so a lot of great points there that I, that I would want to go deeper. But so let's say you have a leader that has all these people in their team and they all have different strengths and they understand on theory, hey, I need to boost all these different talents, but then they prefer certain method methods. So let's say we have a, a super ordered leader who prefers discipline over and process over everything. And they understand in theory, the value of creativity, right? Creativity, um, the Google 20% rule, we see examples across uh, history, um, Leonardo da Vinci kind of like exploring different topics and that's how we achieve mastery uh, on short, if we analyze short periods of time, he could look like the typical artist who didn't finish any, any project because he jumped from interest to interest. But then overall, we definitely see his genius, right? I'm sure that can happen within a team. So if you have that leader, and it could it could go either way, right? Like you have a super creative leader who who um, errs on the side of chaos, or you have a super ordered leader who doesn't like chaos that much. How would you advise them to not only in theory support the other side, but also whenever some resistance comes with with within them like oh the deadline or the discipline like how to allow for what they don't necessarily understand to develop knowing that it's the opposite of what they usually are comfortable with yeah and and this this is where working on and strengthening team dynamics is so important and why it's so important to get that right first and and pay attention to that first before just moving to 
strategy. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of senior level leaders just sort of mistakenly assume that if they hire a high ranking leader who has a past track record of success and they pair them with other high functioning leaders and they hand them a strategy, they're adults, they're smart people, they're highly accomplished, they're going to figure it out. And they discount the fact that a lot of other variables had to come together successfully for that track record to be so good, right? Um, when you put a new combination of leaders in a room and you expect them, you know, either to just accept a strategy that's already been formulated or co-create a strategy, they are not going to do that if they don't trust each other. They're just not. And the way to do that, you know, again, part of that is to, is to raise the awareness of, you know, this may be how I process the world or what I go to first, whether I'm more results oriented or process driven, or I like to, you know, iterate a little bit more and be creative, or I'm more of a, you know, let's just solve the problem first kind of a person. Now we can be more aware of that and more mindful of that with our peers and understand that if I see the world very differently because my brain naturally processes things in a certain order that is very different from yours, I now have to understand that that's how we are going to come at a problem, right? That we're likely going to clash at first because we're going to see things from such different angles. But if I know that, then I'm also going to be more receptive to the possibility of a richer conversation and a richer solution to a problem. Now, that does not dismiss the fact that as a business, you have milestones, you have deadlines, and you have a budget, right? So at the end of the day, all of those things need to be met. But if you work on that team dynamic first and understand you know, what, what makes different people tick and how they tend to process a scene or a situation, you can get through that potential clash of ideology or perspective a lot faster because you're assuming not that they don't know what they're talking about, but that they're just coming to it from a different perspective. And now I'm going to be open to, well, let me hear them out. Right? So it's, it's not an easy thing because especially if you've got a room full of people who are just very, very driven, very bottom line, we've got to get this done. We've got to solve this problem because we've got all these other things, you know, sort of going on. And that's a, that's a refrain I hear quite a lot. Well, bandwidth, and we're so overwhelmed. We've got all these problems to solve. If you don't take one step back and understand, you know, and look at a situation from all sides to make sure that the decision you're ultimately going to make is the most balanced and the right decision is going to help you move the needle in the right direction. Over the long term, you're going to lose ground because you're going to keep coming up against these clashes of ideology, these, these conflicts of different perspectives that you did not give enough oxygen to in the, in the front end to figure out how to resolve, you know, and, and coming back to this sort of this resistance and using the excuse of we've got so many other problems to solve. We don't have time to dwell on this one for, for very long. I, I hear leaders tell me that all the, all the time to which I then say, it's great that you're all a bunch of problem solvers but have you paused to consider that you might be solving the wrong problems, right? Because just because you are able to solve a high volume of problems doesn't necessarily mean you're smart or working in a smart way. It just means you're really good at firefighting. And how often do we hear that about leaders, right? Or teams, we're really good at firefighting, but that longer term strategic planning, not so much. Well, this is why. Because you're tackling every problem you see without taking one step back and being far more discerning about whether these are the right problems to tackle. That's such a great point, Claire. So then in your experience, is it better for leaders to, because if you have that person, right, that it's great at solving problems, they identify it quickly and come up with a solution. Um, there are stages in business where that, is what is needed versus some other times where you just need the creativity. So in general, for the businesses that you work with, how would you advise them to, to go over those transformations? Is it the same leader? Um, hey, you just have to work on, on acquiring different skills and mindsets because it's always going to be you? Or is at some point better to 
maybe move and you be the chairman and you hire a CEO and you let that person continue the journey because that's what's best for the business. Yeah, I, you know, I would I would say that people need to, need to remember, especially business owners and especially smaller business owners, that growth is not um, a continuous phase, right? And what I mean by that is we are all trying to grow our business, but it's not a constant activity. There is quite often a phase of growth, um, you know, year to year, quarter to quarter, even month to month. And really savvy business leaders and business owners recognize what phase they are in and what phase they need to be in to keep moving forward. Um, and so that's, that is what I would say first is that, you know, the, the leaders at the highest level of the organization possible need to recognize what phase are we in, in this given situation, right? Um, and I say year to year and quarter to quarter, it could be situation to situation or decision to decision, but you could assemble the same leadership team five days in a row and have them tackle the right problem, given the phase that you want them to to be looking at, right? So it could be that you're setting the stage to say, I, we need to solve this problem or this set of problems to remove the barriers to growth. That's one phase is growth. You could come back on, you know, an, on another day and say, we need to solve this set of problems or narrow down the set of problems to stay within profit mode, right? So we've got to reduce expenses and increase you know, profit margin and all of that sort of thing. They're related profit mode and growth mode and creativity mode, but they're not necessarily things that you're going to do simultaneously. Um, that does not mean that your leadership team can't tackle each of those sets of problems or those modes you know, with that same combination of people. They just have to have the right mindset to tackle the right set of problems for that particular mode, if that makes sense. No, that makes total sense. Um, that makes total sense. And last question on people, um, but, and this might be a little bit outside of the scope of what we're covering, because we're talking about, okay, how do, how do leaders stay flexible enough and, and broaden their perspective to, to under, incorporate all these different aspects? And we talked about vulnerability, purpose, connecting, being a little bit more transformational. And I've seen it on both sides where people say, hey, a job is a job do your job, be professional, but your purpose and your meaning, you're going to find it somewhere else. And also companies that are like families that they know each other, they know their families, they spend a ton of time. So of course we have a ton in that spectrum. And as I've also seen that some of the companies that are number one in their industries are usually really good at having purpose and connecting everyone and, and boosting their talent. And recently we've seen a huge amount of layoffs, even from the top companies. And, and I get it from both sides, right? Like I don't understand why they did it the way they did it, especially for example, the Google, people that have been there for almost two decades, they get an email, they, they don't get it. They get their access restricted and that's it, right? I also get it that um, in most cases, I don't know the specifics, but it's done to preserve the system, right? This is what we need to do. Like leadership decisions are not easy. When you go to war against Hitler, a lot of people are going to die in that war, but you're doing it because you believe that the net positive effect of that decision is gonna be the best one. In this war, a lot of people are going to die. And I know this is kind of like an extreme example, but that's the decision that they had to make. We see it also on on the 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 movie about the Enigma machine, where mm. they they lock, unlock the code, and then one of the per people in the team they want to save their brother because they see the information and he stops and like, no, we can't because if not, they're gonna know uh, that we decoded it and all this work is gonna go to waste. We need to be strategic. We need to let them um, have some successful attacks, even though we have the information and be strategic about how we use this and, and they were able to do so. So I definitely, I don't know the specifics of this decision, but I can certainly understand, oh, how inhuman it is to fire someone that's been there for this many years with, that, with an email. And I can also understand the other side of, 
well, this is what's best to save the system and to have a net positive so that a lot more people can maintain their jobs and we can keep serving our communities in the world. So how do you, when you see this kind of things happening, what are the thoughts that come to mind from your perspective of being an, an, an expert in this area of understanding talent, understanding people and trying to connect with a purpose? When you see something like this, you do you think, wow, what a what a hit to the purpose and, and everybody else that's gonna stay? Or or is it well, it was probably the best? Like what what are the thoughts that come to mind when you see something like this? Yeah. So uh, you know, the these these massive layoffs that have been in the news recently of of major brand household name companies that we all know um have been really difficult to watch because to your point, the leaders at the very, very top have knowledge and information and you know are, are seeing around corners that the rest of us don't have access to, right? So there's so there's that. Um, but the other thing that I think of when I look at these massive layoffs and the way that they've been done is, oh my gosh, what a horrendously missed opportunity. Because if at the end of the day, Given the knowledge, the information, the facts that these leaders, you know, these ultimate decision makers had at the time that drove them to make the decision that they did, they said that the only way that we can move forward and grow or, or prune and then grow stronger, et cetera, is to do this. They, they missed, again, explaining to the masses the why. And especially when you're talking now, and again, not divulging confidential financial information or competitive data or, or you know, um, insider trading or any of that. Obviously, there are certain rules and, and guide, guardrails that they can't, you know, they can't violate. But not only did their former employees now leave with a with a really bad experience, they could have worked there, to your point, for multiple decades and loved the company and had this brand loyalty. Well, now all of that is erased by one email, by one email. And because these brands are such household names, the brand reputation takes such a hit that I don't know that all of these companies that chose to do it the way that they did it are going to come back from that. Um, you know, I, and I, I really don't want to go back to your Hitler example, but I kind of have to, because you, you put it out there on the table you know, when you when you think about how one man was able to to motivate people to commit atrocities who otherwise would never have thought to do that, you have to think if he could unite people to fulfill a strategy based on his unifying message of atrocity. How can other leaders flip that on its head and unify people around a message for good? You know, and, and listen, you said it before, we're talking mostly about for-profit companies. At the end of the day, they also need to be profitable, but they don't have to be atrocious about it. They don't have to discount people's, you know, the, the, when, when you end someone's job whether because they have committed gross misconduct, kind of a separate category, or you've had to terminate, or you've had to do a layoff, or you've had to shut down a, a division, you are materially impacting that person's life. And the responsibility is on you as a leader on how you do that, right? The, 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 the why that motivated them to do these very drastic cutbacks is so important. So, you know, for, for those leaders, and I've always said about Elon Musk, um, just to pick one example, this is a brilliant guy who is so visionary that he didn't want to wait for NASA to get his, its act together for us to colonize Mars. So he went out and created a company that made a reusable rocket. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what does. This guy is is the absolute opposite of an underachiever. He is a big thinker. He's very visionary. He's brilliant. He never rests on his laurels, but he is the worst people leader I've ever seen, right? And so, 
you know, right before he took over Twitter and started doing whatever it is he's doing, I kept using him as the example of he's a really visionary guy who's got no business leading people. Like keep him in a, you know, in the corner, being the thought leader, being the guy who keeps challenging status quo, but don't let him actually interact with people and provide them performance feedback or, or God forbid, send out emails that lay off half the workforce, right? Um, it, and that kind of comes back to this earlier theme of put people in their fast lane, like interacting with employees and communicating decisions that that blow up their world is not his fast lane. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I use the Hitler example because I think that's one where from whichever point of view you see it, it was the right decision, right? I think there's other um, wars where maybe there's some uh, different opinions, but I think this one, if you analyze it for from before, during, and after, um, of course it made sense, right? Like that kind of evil needed to be stopped at, at whatever cost because the, the outcome of stopping that evil was better than, than anything else. Um, but that's a great point about Elon because um, there's so many, I think the challenge is there with those visionaries who challenges them if they don't have the, 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 um, self-awareness of understanding that they're not um, experts in those fields. I think there's a lot of historic examples of, for example, Napoleon um, advising uh, Beethoven and Get on on their writing and their music and, and things like that, just, <laughs> just because they were able to achieve, um, let's say, mastery. I don't know. Um, of course, we can catalog some of Napoleon's achievements of negative, but he definitely was a, a master um, in terms of playing the game of power so uh, there's definitely a lot of examples of, of when when the self-awareness fails and they think they can do so many other things um but i want to there's we could go so many deeper places in, in there's so many rabbit holes we can go down right yeah. now right <laughs> but i, I want to go i want to go i want to go on the positive side we we cool. went down the rabbit hole of people and we ended up on on a on a not so nice topic let's let's flip it and go to you also have a great concept, which is um, the, the purpose flow and business flow. The word flow, um, mm. I, I love that word. And I want to talk about how do you measure what are some of the signs? For example, personally, I find it that when I, um, and we can connect this to Elon when he says, um, no, you got to work all this many hours and no slacking. I think he finds flow in 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 work and being curious and learning. And he mistakenly thinks that everybody else in the world also find it flow. And if they're not working, they're slacking. So you got to be working this many hours. Well, different people find flow with different activities. So when we're trying to measure the flow of a business, what are some of the signs you look for to understand, um, hey, maybe we're not going to Mars, but we are achieving our kind of flow. What what could a small business owners look for to understand, hey, we, we have actually achieved flow? Yeah, love that. Um, and so again, just like my use of the word purpose has at least two different meanings. Um, flow for me is a very key word. Um, as a word, it is this, it is this state of um, as an individual operating in your fast lane in ways that feed your motivators, right? So that you've got this sort of, um, you're literally in a zone and you're doing it in a way that, that refills your cup and, and doing it in a way where you can be the most authentic version of yourself. That to me on an individual level is what a state of flow looks like. Organizationally, my use of the word flow is actually an acronym. Um, and so when I work with, um, you know, businesses, whether they're small businesses looking to grow, you know, they're going to add another location, they're going to, you know, they're going to do a merger, et cetera, or even larger organizations. One of the, the, the frameworks I take them through is called this flow chart. And, and again, we start with this foundational, let's really clarify what your purpose is, what your mission is, right? Um, and, and understand, you know, where, where you're heading, because once we can do that, then we can start to fill in 
the F, the L, the O, and the W. And the F is what are all the fundamentals that are required that are absolutely mission critical to you getting closer to that to that mission or achieving that purpose. Um, and and that's everything from um, you know technical expertise to you know customer growth to um, you know the the sort of the the soft skills that you need. You know whether it's we need more people with strategic perspective or financial acumen or problem solvers or you know deep empathy and all of that sort of thing. And compiling a very detailed inventory of what those fundamentals are, and then dividing those into two buckets. The ones that stay in F are the ones that are current gaps. So what are your fundamental gaps, right? What are the things that you have said are mission critical, but are either completely lacking or you're under, you know, you're sort of under-resourced on? The second bucket is what are the things that we have in spades? What of those mission critical fundamentals do we do very well? Do we have an abundance, et cetera? Um, and so those go into this sort of second bucket of what I call levers of strength. So that's the L. And then the O is all around, okay, if if that's your, your mission, your purpose, your North Star, where you're heading, and these are all your mission critical fundamentals, both your gaps and your levers of strength, what are the obstacles that are standing in your way? Um, you know, I, I always kind of say to, to groups when I'm when I'm working with them, if we can name it, we can tame it, right? Because again, kind of going back to this this notion of this this cycle of complaining and the cycle of sort of you know um, victimizing ourselves and saying I don't have any power to change the outcome. If we name what those obstacles are, and the more concrete we can make them, and the more clear we can make them, the far easier it is to convert those into opportunities, or at least to minimize them, right? So that they don't um, you know sort of torpedo our success as a, as a business. And then that final bucket is the W. So what are the wins? What does success look like? How will we recognize it when we see it? How will we measure it, um, right? What are, the, what are the goals that we're going to, what are the metrics we're going to measure our forward progress and ultimate success against? Um, and I literally will work on this with teams and we can map it out on one page. And you know, I, I, I work with clients all the time to kind of build that flow chart. And then they'll just kind of put it up on their wall. They'll take down the mission statement that was collecting dust that no one really you know, bought into anyway. And they put up this flow chart because it very quickly and succinctly kind of orients them to every decision that we make from now on. We wanna use this as our, as our guidepost. Again, coming back to that dual meaning of purpose, both purpose as a goal and purpose as intentionality. Now we wanna make decisions that are based on, you know, does this help us address a fundamental gap? Does this help us put the foot on the gas and leverage a strength? Does this help us to overcome or minimize an obstacle? Does this help us to move closer to a win? Um, and so I, I just sort of gave you a kind of a mini masterclass on how to how to build that flow chart. Um, but it's really very, very powerful when you can get um, a leadership team or even groups of individual contributors to come together and build that as a team. Because one, it is very actionable once you've built it. And two, the building of it when you co-create it is going to help to build buy-in and engagement with your team. Well, that was a, a great uh, mini masterclass. Um, <laughs> and I want to go um, deeper into one of those components because I feel like the, the, the F uh, and the L we've covered a bit in the conversation we've been having so far, right? Like understand where the gaps are, where your strengths are, and use that as a as a lever. Um, and then with the win component, how would you advise people to look for ways to help define what winning means? And I say mm -hmm. that because, for example, sometimes I have clients that the other day I was having a conversation and someone told me, well, I, I sent... I sent the article to my list in an email and only, I think, I think they told me only 70% open rate, not so exciting. I'm like, what? Like, do you have an idea of what that means? Um, that's an amazing open rate. I would rate. kill, I would kill for 70% like, open rate on my emails. <laughs> like, what is your normal then? If, if any, and it's a decent sized list. So I was like, that's, um, so I think a lot of the times, um, 
when you work as a consultant, you have an understanding of the benchmarks and you have an idea of where they fall and, and what is good and what is not good. But sometimes for the business owner, they just see their own results. So they might be thinking, um, hey, I'm not doing well. I need to optimize. And it's like, no, you're doing the best. If anything, you just need to, like if you had that open rate, you just need to keep adding people to your list. Don't yep. worry about anything else, right? Like it's a it's a funnel, like put just more people through your funnel because you're you're killing it. Uh, yeah. But they don't know it, right? Because they don't have that perspective. So how would you advise when you come in and, and work with a team what, how would you work with them to have a, a win metric that helps them understand um, their uh, performance compared to um, everyone else in, and I know it's sometimes it's difficult to, to define an industry or a niche, but have an idea of what is uh, mediocre, good, and great performance. Yeah. So I'm going to give you the consultant answer, which is it depends, right? Um, the, the, first, the first place I would start especially if a business is kind of doing this for the first time and hasn't really quantified what a win does look like, um, is to really sort of take one step back and say, um, you know, what measurements would matter, right? What are the things that are going to help drive better decisions for us? What's the information we need to know um, that if we look at that at a more regular basis and, and you know, seek to quantify that, it's going to help us make both short, medium, and, and long-term decisions. So I would kind of start with, with that bucket. And then if, if you're able to get even, you know, five or 10 of those, I mean, don't go, don't go crazy. I tell people all the time and larger organizations are so guilty of this. They just, they measure every possible thing that they can, can measure just because the data is available. Um, just because you can measure it doesn't, doesn't make it actionable. If it's just noise, if it's just something that, you know, is a vanity metric because you can measure it, if it's not driving a better decision and it's not kind of giving you some some clues and some sort of mile markers on on you know where to pivot then throw them out like don't you know don't create more noise for yourself because again it's sort of the you know just because you can solve problems doesn't mean you're solving the right ones right um so i would start with that list and i would and i would really kind of cap it at 5 to 5 to 10 and if you're just starting out just get 5 that are really really important to you and then measure where you are right now Right before you even look outside at competitive benchmarks and say, you know, how are other people doing, which is important, but first you have to understand where you're starting. So, you know, identify what those metrics are that are truly going to drive better business decisions. And then benchmark for yourself or kind of set that baseline of where you are today. And then, you know, you can do one of two things. I mean, one of the things that I recommend to clients is look five years out. Don't go beyond five years. If COVID taught us anything, it was that these 10 and 20 year strategic plans were ridiculous. Um, so, you know, everyone's kind of scaling back and saying, let's be more realistic and say, where do we want to be in five years? So set for yourself, you know, that bar of, of that five year, you know, where do we want to get to? And then pull that back and say, okay, what would be a meaningful um, first step or next milestone? If, you know, our, our metric is this, and our current rate is X, how do we get to X plus 5%, 10% a year from now, right? Um, realistic, but a little bit of a stretch, right? Um, because I think too often, you know, again, we don't quantify what success is gonna look like. And if you can't, if you don't measure it, you can't move it. Um, the other thing that I typically do more so with smaller organizations, but even with the larger ones is, you know, the more people you can kind of engage in this co-creation process of that flow chart and the, and the purpose and, you know, the direction and all of that, ask them what success would look like on an individual level. And again, I know this sounds very labor intensive. You can do, you can do this in a way where it doesn't require you to have one-on-one -on -one interviews. You can do it as a survey. Um, you know, if you really want to, but you sort of crowdsource what success looks like for people personally. And then it, there's even ways to automate that. So like, you know, if you, if you want the lowest labor intensive way to do that, you send out a survey, you take the information, you throw it into one of these free word cloud generators, and you see what comes out as the biggest words of your team. Um, it, it's, it's so simple and it is so powerful. Because then when you go back and you share that with the organization, 
it validates for them that their individual goals and their individual passions matter. And if I feel like the company cares about helping me move closer to my own goals, I'm going to put in more of that discretionary effort, right? So then you kind of counter this, this quiet quitting and the great resignation and the presenteeism and all of this other garbage that's standing in the way of good, well-intentioned companies trying to do something great. There's something that I think if I would summarize all the information that I was able to gather in preparation for this conversation and what we've talked about is that you help business owners say with confidence that their business owners are not self-employed, right? With everything that you build is to make sure, hey, this is a system that works. This does not depend on one person or a few people to run. This is a system that is creating, it's working with a lot of different parts. It's working well, it's balanced, and it's creating value for everyone involved. And I see this trend where there's a lot of people um, creating their own advising and consulting businesses. I think it's gonna, technology has allowed more people to do that in an easier manner. And I know you advise um, businesses who are thinking about exiting and making that transition. So I wanted to get your take on there's a lot of creators, advisors, consultants that are starting their own business and they are currently, they think they have a business, but they are self-employed. And, and there's going to be a trend just like we're seeing it now with the baby boomers that there's a ton of businesses that don't have a continuation plan. And a lot of people are going to lose a ton of value that they've created because they did not position their business for an exit. So they're going to, maybe they're going to get an exit, but not at the valuation they could because they did not think they did not think about what was next. So if you were advising some of these people now, maybe they've been laid off and they're starting their own consulting, coaching, or advising business. They're going to run it. Um, let's say they have this five-year plan um, to, to get it to a point where, yeah, I know I'm a self-employed person now, but I want to be a business owner. And maybe then I could sell it. I don't know. How would you advise a coach or a consultant to position their business. Let's say they are currently between low six figures. They're making one to 200,000 in, in revenue. What would your advice be to help them position that business for a successful exit in the next five to 10 years? It's, it's, a, it's a big question. And I think it's an important one because most of us, because I, I count myself in that group um, who you know, whether we're ex-corporate, whether we've tried other business ventures, et cetera, and are going into this, this great big blue ocean of being a consultant, being a coach, being an advisor. Um, we don't typically, most of us think about the exit plan. Um, and so, and not all of us are, are positioning ourselves that way, right? But for those who are, for those who are contemplating that, so I want to, I want to answer the exact question you asked. Um, you have to be, and I'm going to use that word again, as intentional in building up your business as you will be about exiting it. And what I mean by that is the most important person you're going to hire when you're starting out is your very first person, right? Because we all know when we start out as solopreneurs, our business is synonymous with our with our personal brand. It really is. No matter, you know, my business is Talent Boost, but really it's Claire Chandler. And it's one of the reasons that I'm sort of downshifting my emphasis on talent boost as my website and, and much more putting my clairechandler.net um, at the forefront because it continues to be a direct expression of, of me, right? But that first person that you hire, unless they're you know a virtual assistant or somebody who's always going to be behind the scenes, they're going to be a brand ambassador and they're going to be an expression of and an extension of your personality. So you have to get that one right. But fast forward to five years, 10 years, 15 or 20 years down the road, if, if part of your vision is to build up a business uh, to a point where it can be sustained and attractive enough to sell and exit, um, it, it's, it's, so, it's so funny that you're asking this question because I literally had this conversation earlier today around the importance of um, the exiting business owner 
getting all of their leadership ducks in a row before they sell. There's a lot of emphasis, especially in the investor community that I that I work within, um, to get the leadership team in particular aligned as quickly as possible after the deal closes, right? Because otherwise they're not going to execute the growth strategy. There has been less emphasis on, which is why it's such an important question you're asking, on get, making sure that leadership team has itself aligned there's cohesion, they work effectively together, and they're bought in on where the company wants to go after the sale, it is just as important then, right? Especially for that business owner who isn't going to be around anymore because I have yet to meet a business owner in a situation that you've just described that does not care about their legacy. If they are planning for an exit ultimately, they're not doing it like they're flipping a house. They are doing it so that the business that they have built, the team they have assembled, the brand, the client equity, all of that remains and, and outlives them. So if you know, you're know you listening to this conversation and you are contemplating that at some point in your future, you absolutely want to pay as much attention to getting your leadership team aligned and bought in um, so that you attract the right investor. So the transition is 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 as smooth as possible and so that your legacy can be preserved. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so much sense. And it, it goes, I think it also goes back to, to the flow methodology that you described, right? Like you need to make sure that the, the F, the L and, and the, what they consider winning with the acquiring companies align so that, um, everything can can keep moving forward smoothly but yeah i think i think a lot of that is going to happen in the next few years just like we're seeing it now with with physical businesses i know there's a ton of uh, underground boring businesses that there are going to be um, a great opportunity for value creation for a lot of people and i have no doubt that because of the trends that i've been seeing in the coaching consulting and advice for business that a lot of value is going to be able to be created by people who understand that and, and are able to to grab a business and align it with the methodologies that the buyers are looking for so that it's clear to understand the value that those businesses are generating. But uh, Claire, we've talked about flow, purpose, people. We even talked about Hitler, Napoleon, wars, <laughs> Elon Musk, going to Mars. So many topics. And when people ask you, what do you do? What is your typical answer? So my my typical answer, and the solopreneurs in your audience will will get this because it my my answer evolved over time, right? Um, but but really my focus is being a a thought leader to many and becoming a thought partner to to the select few, right? Um I I am ex corporate. Um, I have have focused my business and built my business around helping leadership teams work together more effectively in less time. Um, you know, getting them out of their own way, creating cultures of trust and authenticity. Um, you know, we are we are finally at a stage where the where the world appreciates that trust and authenticity are business critical components. They are not nice to have. Um, that culture is not a fluffy HR word, but that it is absolutely the foundation, um, you know, that can make or break a business. And, you know, my mantra has always been that the biggest impact on the, uh, on any company's culture is the behavior of its leaders. And so the more leaders I can, I can help impact in a positive way, um, to get them to be more authentic, to get them to lead with more transparency, and to get them to, um, you know, build leadership teams that can accelerate trust. The more impact I I get, the honor of witnessing. You know, it's not even oh I get to make an impact. And while that's important, it's really the the transformation that I get the honor to witness when I'm in a room full of these leadership teams, and that life finally goes on, and that breakthrough happens. And it's it it's it's so transformational for me, and it's why I do what I do, um, because I get to witness that in some really great companies with some really amazing people 
who at the end of the day just want to to do some some world impacting things. And are there any particular companies, maybe size, maybe industry or stage that are a best fit for what you do with them? Yeah, so my ideal uh, kind of sweet spot is larger, complex, primarily U.S.-based organizations. Um, I have worked internationally, but U.S. is obviously a little bit easier to get to. Um, I do like to do a lot of my um, leadership kind of teamwork in the same room. You know, now that we're sort of sort of through the brunt of COVID, we're we're back to doing that, which is fantastic. Um, you know, I I I do work with some startups. Uh, I do work with smaller companies that are on that verge of, of growing, whether they're getting their next round of funding, um, they're looking to expand and want to make sure that they've got you know, the, right, the right leadership team assembled and everybody kind of doing the right things. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say my most ideal sweet spot is large, complex U.S.-based organizations, particularly that have senior level leadership teams um, that are a combination of legacy and new leaders. Um, that, that maybe don't know how to work together effectively because there are, you know, they're overcomplicating it and there are easier ways to get them to, to gel than perhaps they've thought of. I feel we could talk for hours about leadership and leaders. Um, I know we left some rabbit holes unexplored throughout our conversation, but I want to be mindful of your time. So is there anything else before we wrap up? Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience? We'll link to your website. Um, in in the the worksheet that I downloaded, I know you have that as a as a free resource, so we link to that as well. But is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience before we close? You know, I I think just sort of in in closing, it's kind of to, to reinforce this. There is this direct correlation between trust and authenticity, and it works both ways, right? It works from leader to to the workforce. And it works from the workforce back to the leader. If there is not trust, if there is not this authentic, um, you know, culture where people can truly be themselves and bring their best selves to work and all of those things, and I know it's cliche, um, but there is a direct correlation between, between trust and authenticity. And, you know, around this concept of if you don't get your teams to trust each other, you will not grow. Um, it doesn't matter what size company you are running or you are in. If your teams don't trust each other and you, you will not achieve your growth strategy. I think that's a that's a great closing message. If you don't get your team to trust, you are not going to grow. Well, thank you very much, Claire, for being here with us and, and sharing your amazing insights. I enjoyed this conversation. For everybody out there listening, thank you for being with us and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you.